Check. One, two. Pa, pa, pa. Sibilance. <laughs> Hi, friends. Nice to see you. Nice to be seen. Welcome back to the program. My name is Dean, as always. Uh, joining me on this beautiful day, my friend Lachlan Cross at Lachlan Cross on Twitter, uh, 30 year radio veteran, and now the host of his life, ladies and gentlemen, at Lachlan Cross. Um, I want to give you some advice quickly sure. before we bring David on, and, and yeah. let's just let's get this out of the way quickly. Okay. So you're doing yoga tonight with the uh, with with the, the, with the girlfriend? Yeah. Yeah, we're doing yoga this evening. So Go whenever I talk to yoga. anybody about uh, yoga. Because you're you, I I don't know I don't know you like you and I have never played sports together, but no. a lot of men are very much wired to be conf- competitive. Like yeah. they've they've got that competitive instinct. Sure. And you can, as a beginner, you can get you can hurt yourself if you're trying to do the the stuff that other people in the room are doing. No, I don't have a competitive bone in my body when it comes to that kind of stuff. I'm okay. not I'm not going to go to don't hurt yourself. Eat. No, no, I'm I'm that guy that's like where they say. Take a break whenever you want. It's like sweet relief when I hear those words yeah. in a yoga class. Take some Don't water. Don't try and do too much. Yeah, I'm going to take water. I'm a little nervous, though, because last time I went to yoga, by the way, I'm not a flexible man, but the last time I went to yoga, it was like two years ago, three years ago, pre-pandemic, right? Yeah, all the yoga okay. studios shut down because it's like can't breathe on each other and all that other stuff. And um, the gentleman who was doing the class laid on my back at some point to get me to... <laughs> Yeah, you and I'm a, I'm a big like don't touch me guy. I got a big personal yeah. space thing. Like I uh, listen, I'm no issue shaking hands, no issue hugging somebody. But yeah. when someone touches me unannounced, no, don't. Or when someone lays on my back, don't unannounced. It's a little uh, concerning. Yeah, yeah. So I that think was it for me. I was like, eh, I'm done. I will say oh, this: I have been to hundreds of classes in a studio over the years. I'm doing my um, <laughs> yoga teacher training in May. May yep. uh, May first to the fifteenth. I'm gone for two weeks. I'm going down yes. to Joshua Tree. You're a big yogi. Yeah, I'm. I'm a big You're fan. You're a yogic it's, yogi. I got into it when I was forty. After I broke my tailbone, I've been doing it for like almost thirteen years. Probably thirteen years now. Yeah, thirteen years. And I plan on doing it for the rest of my life. And um, when I got shit canned from Cruz, I was like, you know what? I've been talking about it. Now is the time. I'm just going to bite the bullet and I'm going to go do it. I'm very excited about it. But anyway, back to my point about the touching thing. I have been to hundreds of classes and I can count on one hand how many times a, an instructor has even touched me. So that's that's not a common thing. All right. I'm just making sure it's not a common thing because I don't want anybody coming around but laying it, hands on me to, today, this afternoon, going, you need to get lower in the downward dog. It's you need to get lower. I don't need that. It's. I think it's a thing of the past. All right. I, I don't. I don't think you, you should. You should worry about it. Plus, I get so relaxed in those uh, yoga classes that it. Uh, by the time you're done a yoga class, you're like, Namaste. Like it means something when you say Namaste. You're like, Oh, I feel really good. Speaking of peaceful people, today's guest is one of those. Look at you with the segue. Do you like that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's, you get segue points. Thanks, buddy. Between him and Fawcett. Easily two of my favorite writers. Hard is like one up, one down. Um, David Moskrop is an author. He's the uh, author of a book called Too Dumb for Democracy. Maybe one of the great reads of our time. Uh, he's a writer for the Globe Mail, Washington Post, Jacobin, TVO. Uh, and of course, he's got a sub stack. And his sub stack is bananas. It's one of those cool sub stacks where you're like, I always learn something, and, 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 and no one's preachy in these in these uh, articles, in these Substacks. And I want to learn about Substack, but more importantly, I want to have David Moskrop on because we went at it this week over chocolate bars, and uh, we've got big news to start as well. Please welcome David Moskrop, ladies and gentlemen, to the program yet again. Uh, My Moskrop. thing with, with David... Just can well, I can I interject here quickly? Well, he, hasn't I, said, he hasn't said a word in your interview. I, I want to hear what, what Lachlan has to say. Oh, okay, then go ahead. Lachlan. I I appreciate the injection in, in, of humor into what he does, mm. which I think is um, not easy to do. It's it's a difficult thing to do as as a writer, and not only that, when you're writing, because I know you now and I've read not a lot of your stuff, but a bit of your stuff. I hear you. 
when I'm reading you, I hear you. Isn't that nice? Yeah. It's very nice. That's extreme. That's, that's also, extraordinarily nice. Thank you. It's also difficult to do. Oh, Be nice. nice. No. Have a voice. Have a have a voice. Have a voice. Like have your voice when you write. And that's tough, right? For a lot of different people. Yeah. Lock brings up a good point. Yeah. Some people like you get like I am not a writer. I blog, but I blog like I talk because I'm a moron. I, you, I hear you uh, when I read your writing, Dean, too. But that's not a compliment. <laughs> Moscraft's laughing at me. He's it like, sounds like a guy falling down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I take no offense to it because yeah. I did not go to school for 33 years like David Moscraft. I do not have just a got doctorate. Out. Yeah, did you? You just got out? You're done? You're done? <laughs> Some days I want to go back and then I yeah. um, run myself into the wall <laughs> a couple times. I'm like, no. No, no. Last, yeah. well, what do you mean? You've got a doctorate. What do you go back for? Like, can you get? Yeah, no kidding. Well, you doctorate. can go back for. They'll take your money. Well, I know they'll take your money, but like, how much more can you level up past doctor? You got your bachelor's. You got your. You just get a different. You get a different, different doctor if you want. Get more doctorates. Yeah. No, I just. I, I there are days where I think I'm like, oh, maybe I should go back and do economics, <laughs> just to learn more. You know, I've got nothing left to prove. I don't need credentials. I just yeah. thought it'd be good to learn more. And then I think, you know what? I'll just get an audio book. <laughs> Just you can it's better. Some of it'll go easier. You know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get my first aid certificate. Like it's stuff like that. You need to kind of fill out the periphery of your skill set, right? You're yeah. academically smart. Yeah. Go take axe throwing or something instead. Yeah, you know, I you know what I'm doing and I have been doing for a little while, me and uh, Megan. Uh rec sports. We're into rec sports because yeah. we're 40. And <laughs> but I am getting into better shape at 40 than than i was in my 20s or in parts of my 30s and rec sports and i'm joining a second rec sport league because i'm so, so all in on it what do and you what do you play is, is it dodgeball and so the the monday night league is multi-sport so yeah it's like kinball ringette floor <laughs> hockey futsal dodgeball uh chook ball all kinds of stuff and then in the summer we do field sports so football yeah some Gaelic football, soccer, ultimate. And then on, I'm going to joining a soccer league because I really want to sprain my ankle. <laughs> so, but, but that's, that's my attempt to, to be physically and mentally, you know, this goes back to Plato. Incidentally, I remember being in undergrad and reading Plato and that was when my brain. Oh, I heard Plato the, like, like plasticine. No, but yeah. the Plato with the T and Pla Plato argued basically healthy body, healthy mind. He was the OG healthy body, healthy mind guy. And, oh, yeah. and, and Plato that, was healthy body, healthy mind. And that bred into uh, stoicism, Epicureanism, where they're like, hey, you can never stop challenging yourself yes. mentally and physically. And physically, you challenge yourself, you'll be better mentally, to your point. Yeah. Yes, correct. And I, I think that's so powerful and, and important. And so uh, I'm really embracing that, you know, post 40, both strategically for my, <laughs> for my aging body. Yeah. Uh, which, incidentally, yoga can't beat yoga. Uh, and uh, for my brain, so yeah, that that's what I do. But axe throwing is not a bad idea either, and it's a good way to relieve stress from spending your days writing about politics, which is yeah. inherently infuriating. Oh, well, dude! Um, yeah, you need a crazy. relief, right? Yeah. 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 Well, I, Although I, I avoid I avoid though, the axe throwing because it involves drinking, and yeah. I just <clears throat> yeah. That's always a good combo. You joined pickleball, yeah. though, dude. You uh, Locke starts his pickleball career on Friday. Him and the wife yeah. joined pickleball, which is like I used to think it was one of those sports that you took up when you gave up. But then I saw <laughs> then I saw this like it's pickleball league, televised pickleball league on uh, the OLN network. And then I read that the world championship pickleball guy makes four million dollars a year and the tv rights are worth 50 to 60 million dollars a year it's a big deal to right the now world pick and then I, and I started laughing i'm like well maybe i should get into a pickleball yeah league. and then i started reading about um cornholing and yeah. i did listen to the cor <laughs> not like that cornhole it's like one of the biggest up and coming games yeah. it's like beanbags into this thing i know it's That's a fun cool. word to say everybody it's super cool you know what the tv rights for cornhole are 250 million dollars a year on. the world's best cornholer I you're not some dude who who makes like ten million dollars a year, and he's also one of the best frisbee golf guys in the world. So to your point, you might have a career in activities. You don't know how much money yeah. you could make, Moscrop. I think no that's idea. great. I love one of the, the the great things I love about the advance of technology and the democratization of media spaces is that we can now indulge our very varied many interests. Right? You now there's a whole pickleball niche. Yeah, and it's 
and you know and it's just there and it's cool and you can own it and i i think that's fantastic i think one of the great developments in contemporary society is that we have normalized a lot of niche interests and people are cool with it by and large and it's possible for you to indulge it mm. and i when i lived in south korea there was a television channel dedicated to air showing video games like esports and this was in early you know like 2008 2010 now it's very normal right to go twitch streams and so on but then it was sort of new and, and uh, atypical and you could just go watch some guy play starcraft for hours if you wanted to <laughs> and like i don't know that's not watching that isn't my thing but it's cool that other people love and, and have access to yeah. it and i think i think that's great i yeah. always find it funny when they break down the the ratings and the people watching they can and they'll show you on the sports network who's higher and like you know cornhole is like five Huge. spots higher than hockey the right? NHL. Like, yeah <laughs> it is it is cornhole way bigger pickleball way bigger the outdoor hunting shows they rate way higher than any NHL well, show you just watch some are, dude sitting in a stand in a tree for like two hours going wonder if he's going to get it. I wonder if he's going to get it. But to your point, yeah, there's niche stuff for everybody. And I kind of dig yeah. it. Like, I like the fact that everybody gets chance. And you know what I like about you doing that? It's like, it's time to learn how to play again. You know, yeah. like you laughing uh, through the entire political mess and the ecosystem that we see. And you said something last week. You're like, maybe we should just blow up all politics. Maybe we should just do that. And as a political writer, I thought that was fascinating, right? Because you you generally get paid to talk about the minutia involved in politics and to watch you take long breaks on Twitter <laughs> and watch you legitimately go, Hey, listen, I'm having a hard time processing where we're at. Cause I don't understand this. Um, it was almost like it gave me license to get out of the game, to stop talking about it. Like everybody's talking about politics now. Like it's a way to hang some kind of culture collar on people. Like it's mm -hmm. just a, a dunkaroo fest on and on and on and none of it's positive right none of it is where we want to be to lachlan's point last week he was talking about how sick he was of it you know and we're mm -hmm. reaching out having conversations with people on different sides of the spectrum to try and understand why people believe what they believe but i don't even know if that even matters anymore well and it's like driving i can't crazy. bother trying to figure it, it out drives you crazy yeah <clears throat> and it's like boxing crazy yeah it's like boxing and i get up i put on the gloves i go i swing and I tucker myself out and then I need a break between rounds. And there's two, two, there's two bits of that cycle. There's the daily bit and then the semi-regular bit. So the semi-regular bit is after a few weeks or a few months of this, I need to take some time away from it. Mm -hmm. The daily bit is in the morning I get up and I'm ready to go log on and be like, let's, let's do this, you know? And then at night, if I'm logged on, I'm like, I just want to have fun and talk about nonsense for a little while now because I'm now easing into bedtime. <laughs> So I'm like the fighting hours are kind of like nine till four or five or six, maybe. And then at night, it's like after hours, we're just chilling. Um, but then, you know, in the long run, I need breaks, too, because it's a pugnacious space and always will be. And some of that is healthy and some of it's not. But it, it does take a toll in part because you there are bad faith interlocutors and good faith interlocutors, but you end up quarreling with both. And the bad faith folks, th yeah. that's easy. You know, it's just like, fuck these guys. But there's people I like that I get into it with. And that's kind of tough. Hmm. Hmm. Where, like who? Hang on. Like who? Like who? Who do you? Because I'm watching the disintegration of some relationships, right, that you have. And people on both sides of that extreme equation seem to have this understanding or, or this, this impetus for interacting with people that says, well, if you interacted with that person yeah. or you're having a conversation with that person or if you have an opinion, and I notice it around Trudeau a little bit more than ever. If you have an opinion that um, you don't like something this government is doing, you're on the wrong team. And you can't even have a legitimate conversation about, you know, the prime minister's office communications. You can't have a, a legitimate yeah. conversation about their failings without people saying, well, it, you know, using the whole Nazi dinner party thing. Well, hey, listen, if you don't agree with that. Yeah. That means you're the Nazi at the dinner party. It's like this whole yeah. understanding that I used to have of being able to have normal conversations. And I come from this traditional media big gambit, as does Lachlan Cross, where you could literally turn your commercials on and you'd have an NDP commercial, you'd have a PC commercial, you'd have a liberal commercial, and they would all have competing messaging, but it was okay to do that. 
we can't do that now. We can't we can't have conversations with people unless those conversations are predicated by, mm. well, if you have that conversation with him, you're out of the club. You're yeah. The so club. I'm so glad you said that because in the last really in the last couple of years, but particularly in the last six months or so, I have drawn a hard line on not taking that bullshit anymore that I'm going to talk you. to whomever I please, whenever I please, however I please. And if people don't like it, they can just kiss the roundest part of my ass. Like I don't, I don't care. And I'm not going to hide the fact that I want to talk to all kinds of different people that I like all kinds of, of different people. I don't care. You know, I, I talked to, for instance, Stephen yes. Taylor, uh, who is an arch conservative, uh, who, you know, it was bound up in the Harper verse and the Polyev verse, and I hope his side loses. I hope they lose a lot. But I like Stephen Taylor. Mm. I like talking to him and shooting the shit with him about things. And uh, I was on a Zoom happy hour thing with him that that um, Mike Lake uh, hosts, uh, the mm -hmm. MP out of Edmonton, Wetaskiwin, and I had a blast talking to them. I, you know, I also like Michelle Rempel Garner. I like shooting the shit with her too. And you. I disagree with her on a lot of things. I agree with her a lot on some stuff too. And if people don't like it, if they want me to pass some purity tests to be able to exist in the world, then I'm out because you know what? I like the people I like the way I like them for the reasons I like them. And I'm just not going to apologize for that anymore. You don't have to mm. agree. I, I loved the, the, the boxing analogy. Moscow. Oh yes. Uh, okay. That's well kind said. of where, yeah. where Dean and I are at. And that's where our conversation has shifted. You, you, you know what? We don't have to agree with you. We don't even have to like what you say, what you say, but just we can just, like you, we can respect you, we can, we talk can to still you. have a yeah. reasonable conversation yeah. and maybe get some different perspective, right? Um, that's awesome. So loved the boxing analogy, loved that, and I love the idea that you actually take some time to, um, you know, to jump into the silly waters and and we'll get into the chocolate bar conversation. But where yeah. does OJ fit into? Is that is that? Boxing or is that late night uh, murder? <laughs> that would be murder. <coughs> Breaking news, by the way. Yeah, I was joking on Twitter that I hope cancer is acquitted. <laughs> OJ was I, OJ died last night. Died this morning, early this morning. Seventy six years old. Yeah. There you go, OJ Simpson. Dead family yeah. says, um, and everybody remembers the uh, <laughs> this this old trip. I remember where I was. I was at a white spot in Vancouver watching it on television. OJ's big ride with Al Cowlings. Uh, big news, though, that he that he died. And your tweet, you hope cancer get acquitted. How's it going over out there? I think I haven't checked in. I think it's okay. Can you just pull up that Chase photo again for yeah, a sec? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there yeah. You I don't go. love his odds there. <laughs> looking, looking back on it, it looks like he's outnumbered. Uh, can, I, so, can I get a Bronco now? Like, <laughs> I remember that because I remember being at home and watching it on TV and my mom was there and I didn't entirely understand it until later. But for me, that was also when I was coming of age politically a little bit. I was sort of becoming conscious of politics and current affairs. It was also when I discovered kind of Norm MacDonald, who was a mm. huge influence on me. And I just mm. think one of the funniest people who's ever existed. Brilliant. And so much, you know, Lachlan mentioned humor earlier. So much of that formation for me was was watching people like Norm MacDonald and Norm MacDonald in particular just like beat the piss out of OJ week after week after week yeah. and and take swings at power. Part of the thing that I loved about people like Letterman and Norm MacDonald was that they punched up as mm -hmm. a rule and they were not afraid to take big swings at powerful people and to stay on it. And and that's informed yeah. both my my com my humor, I should say, my sense of humor, but also uh, my politics, right, of, of punching up and not punching down. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the OJ thing is interesting because it for me, it just brings back a lot of formative memories of that. And uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't. I'm all for uh, wishing ill on terrible people as long as you're punching <laughs> up. <laughs> so I, I'm not sad to see him go. And I hope it brings some peace to the family of yeah. families of the people yeah. he uh, well put. Yeah, well put. Well you put. Know, I, I miss I, what did you think of because Norm doesn't get a lot of credit for his weekend update on SNL. I know. And it was the and best thought, thing he did. Yes. 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 Thank you. It was the best. So I, there's there's great YouTube supercuts of Norm MacDonald taking a run at OJ. But I, you know, I remember one of the 
funniest bits was when OJ was acquitted, his opening bit on was, well, so murder is legal in the state of California. <laughs> and, and I just remember thinking it's funny. Uh, it's subversive. And he did some of his best work on, on weekend update. And it was really sad that, that he doesn't get uh, enough respect for that. <clears throat> I think the phone rang so much that Lauren just finally said, I, I can't. We, right well, i'm pretty sure that's what happened like from uh, all the old wives tales or urban legends about yeah. mcdonald getting uh put out of saturday night live i believe oj was the impetus at some point yeah you know lauren michaels went up to 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 norm mcdonald he's like dude you gotta chill out on the oj stuff he's like i will <clears> never <throat> do that and then lauren michaels well then you gotta go and he's like see you later and somehow brought him back as turd ferguson about 14 <clears throat> times after that okay too. so so what's funny which was maybe maybe the best performance i don't know but so what, ferguson? yeah uh, Turd, i love turd ferguson uh, the, the whole i mean the whole celebrity jeopardy that was great but that particular yeah. one but i so they brought him back not super long after they'd fired him and i remember mm -hmm. in his monologue he said you know i'm thinking about this because i go from being so unfunny that i'm not allowed in the building mm -hmm. <laughs> to so funny that I'm hosting. He's like, that doesn't make any sense. And I thought about it and I realized I didn't get funnier. The show got worse. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just taking shots at the show. I remember From that. his yeah. monologue. And it's just like, I, I love, I, I just, I love that. I respect that. And, and yeah, I, I to this day, it's Shane a healthy Gil discussion of authority. Yeah. Did a similar thing about, because he, he, uh, he got yeah. fired before he even went on the show. Mm hmm. And then they brought him back. And his monologue is very awkward. I don't know if you watched. Do you know who Shane Gillis is, David? No. Yeah, he's no? got a oh. he's got a Netflix special. He was a writer for Saturday Night Live, and he got fired before he actually. I, I think it was like he had just been hired, and they uncovered some stuff he said about Asian people in a podcast. It's called The Secret Podcast with Shane and Jay. And so uh, the obviously the, not super secret. No, not secret. Not enough. super. No. No. Uh, and his line, his like, his funny line on on uh, on that Dean. Sorry to interrupt. Was no, no go ahead. Um, he said, uh, "You you." Uh, he says, "When you when you upset the theater group, and and you you get something they want, they're gonna find anything to to to, uh, to take it away from you." So he was taking a shot at the people on SNL right at right. the time, they're but they brought him back. Yeah. And while he was on his monologue, there was a lot about, I shouldn't be here. I don't know what's going on. Like, And then he went, proceeded to go on the show, and he was brilliant. He was really good in the skits as well. Might be one of the best Saturday Night Live episodes I've seen in the last two years, actually. It was it was that revenge play, like, you know, his where monologue certain wasn't people great. decided. No, it wasn't awesome, but the skits were amazing. Was really um, where certain people, and we see it every day, right? Where certain people will tell you that you're not the flavor that they want anymore. Or uh, maybe you said something they, they didn't like. Like, we live in that society now. We know how unprogressive progressives can be in regard to that, where they say, hey, you said something we didn't like. Whether it was right or wrong. Um, and we live in that world, right? And you know, we were talking about kissing the roundest part of your ass uh, when it comes to that perspective. And a great example in my mind, you know, watching people, this Alex Jones, Pierre Polyev stuff is fascinating to me in that regard because we've moved past like cancellation or deciding who's morally acceptable to be able to talk to people, talk about people. But there are mutable assholes in this world, right? Yep. And when Alex Jones says, Pierre Polyev's my guy, um, I think that says a lot, right? I think it mm -hmm. says enough about us as people and the fact that nobody said anything about it. Like, there are endorsements you probably don't want as a politician. That would be probably number one in my books. That's on the list. That would be, no, that would be way up on mine. <laughs> that would be way up on mine. Uh, yeah, I... But that's interesting because I mean I draw some hard lines. There are some people I'm not going to fraternize with, talk to, or support because their politics are so heinous and so toxic that it's beyond a moral line for me. Mm. Uh, but but what thinking about all this that raises for me is the the complexity of of our own lives because people get pissy on the internet if you're talking. To someone that they have a beef with because they don't like what they've said or mm -hmm. they stand for and this issue or that issue but in our own lives 
things are way more complicated, right? Like we are, our own family, our own friends, the people we went to school with, the people we play sports with, they're complicated people. They have layers to them. And no one's going around saying, well, you can't talk to your uncle because he said X, Y, or Z. I'm like, well, of mm. course, no one's going to begrudge you talking to your uncle. Um, I, I think we should extend that grace to people. It's just that, you know, the internet surfaces all that and makes easy targets out of people, which is irritating. But the Alex Jones thing really stood out to me because, you know, the Polyev camp, they distance themselves from it. You know, they said, we don't know, we don't recognize the guy in particular or something like that. We don't. They, they kind of sloughed it off. Pierre didn't say anything. He did say something about it, didn't he? Yeah. Well, there was some kind of statement basically, but like, you know, we don't something, the individual in question, right? They didn't even yeah. name him. I can't remember the exact wording, but I do think uh, at some point you can be judged by those who uh, support, support you. you, right? I mean, yeah. if everybody thinks, if, if, the, if the loons think that you're their guy, that probably says something about you. Yeah. He was right about the frogs. No, he wasn't right about the frogs. He was not. No, he wasn't. He's not right about anything. Looking. He's never. Been, no, no, he's not right about anything. He's just insane. Um, the and, and he it on it again. Facebook. No, you didn't. He's making it up now. Yeah. Uh, there, well, you might have found it actually on Facebook. That means yeah, it's you probably can find whatever real. you want on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> um, to your to that point, um, I I, I think he's working for Trudeau. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't imagine a worse endorsement. Like it's like having Charles Manson endorse your party, right? He's the well, Charles yeah, right. Manson of the spoken word, and and um, you know, you, you look at what he did. So, so Trudeau, obviously, this is what the Liberal Party does. They're like, hey, that guy likes you. That means you're you're a terrible person. But in this case, he's actually right. Like, like if this. <laughs> oh my you God! I mean? Finally, yeah. just right. Yeah. Like, like I know that I know the, the the collaring job that that the progressive left likes to hang on anybody that doesn't agree with what they say, but in this case, David, when Alex Jones says Pierre Polyev is your guy, Trudeau's one hundred percent right. That is that is not the guy you want supporting you and your cause in any capacity at all. No. I know anybody can run into a fastball at any point in time, which he did there, but my God. Like if that and and I read the polls this morning, he's up twenty points again. I'm like, this is the craziest world I've it's ever what, lived in. It's like what folks used to say about the Republicans in the U.S. This is by way of an analogy. It was like, well, you know, you might say not every Republican is a racist, mm -hmm. but the racists are all Republicans, <laughs> right? And it's it it does start to tinge you by association. Like if people feel comfortable. If people like if extremists feel comfortable in your space, mm -hmm. then your space is welcoming of extremists. And that's a problem. Right. But this goes back to the, the question of who we get to talk to and be friends with. Uh, I'm friends with a lot of people on the right. Uh, I'm not going to be friends with conspiracy theorist nut jobs or I'm not going to be friends with Nazis. Right? You've got to draw a hard line because that's something outside the boundaries of any kind of acceptable. What about some of the politics. softer conspiracy theories? David, just well, it depends. I mean, I, soft, want, if I they're not be hurting friends. people. Oh yeah, no, no. This is like frog shit. I don't care about frog shit. <laughs> you know, the border is probably like chemtrails. Chemtrails is probably yeah. okay. I could All live right. with a chemtrails person. Flat Earther. Whatever. Could you be with a? Could you be yeah, friends yeah, with a flat, flat Earther? Earth. That's like vintage kooky. Like that's yeah. That's just a fun guy to have around. It doesn't right? hurt anybody, right? No. It doesn't hurt anybody. No. Uh, I do. I do go down the occasional rabbit hole, though, right? And I, I don't want to well, lose you as a friend. No, no, you won't. But, but you know, it's funny. Is, is, you know, a couple years ago, if you had said, "Oh, the NSA is spying on everyone through a massive uh, surveillance network," through I mean, like tinfoil hat stuff, can't be yeah. friends. Turns out it's fucking true, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, that's you know, the world we live in though. and then aliens right it's like ah, it's like it couldn't be possibly aliens and then it's like oh maybe aliens are a thing and it's like page nine <laughs> and so i you know in, in recent years i've sort of shifted the boundary of what i consider to be kooky because a lot of the line kooky moves. things are true well that's the problem that i'm having with guys like alex jones right like I know he's a hateful dick, so let's put that aside. But like but. I, I have a hard time talking about conspiracy theories that I believe in because mm -hmm. 
the goalposts of what was true or what we used to mock as a conspiracy theory where you're like, oh, sudden, sure, there's a, there's a, water. yeah, like, like Jeffrey Epstein's really, and you're like, oh my God, it's yeah, true, I mean, right? San, Sandy Hook is an easy one, right? Like, yeah. like, you know, Sandy Hook is an easy one. It was an absolute awful tragedy in which case a psychopath killed children. Yeah. Right? Like we, if, if we can't all, you know, get together on that one, We've got a serious problem, right? Uh, like that, that's got to be a hard line for civilized conversation. Mm -hmm. But Epstein, the NSA, I mean, maybe well, the aliens, Epstein stuff, I, Alex Jones was way ahead of the curve on that one, wasn't he? Like, that, that, that seems like, to be I'm like a, a clock that's a broken clock that happens to, yeah, the fastball analogy. That's you know, that, right? that, okay, yeah, anytime, yeah. Right? that and the frogs, yeah, not the frogs, dude. <laughs> Get away from fucking frogs. Um, but we see it manifest itself during the eclipse, too, like the conspiracy <laughs> stuff. And I loved every one of them, Gem by trails. the way. Yeah, well, Chemtrails was another one. They sure. said that this was uh, the chance for the satanic magic cabal to shoot some rockets at the moon. That was one of my favorites. Did they hit it? Uh, unknown. <laughs> it's too far away. I haven't seen it. Did they Still making it? its way. Still it's on the way. It's uh, they, it's an it's an EV rocket, so it's taking it's doing it. Right, yeah, yeah. It um, the back end of it, so it's yeah, got to catch the momentum of yeah. That's right. It's got to get the trajectory. Yeah, but uh, my favorite, and I wanted to I wanted to play this one for you. This made me laugh. Because it, this is like a take on it, but I think this guy's onto something. Let's watch it together. Here's what you need to know about the total solar eclipse. Now, a lot of people know that the total solar eclipse will be traveling on a path from frickin' southish to northish over the United States of America. And many people believe that this eclipse pathway is actually opening up a portal for humans to receive downloads of information and connect deeper with the universe. Now, what's crazy is if you take one letter from every city that the eclipse is traveling over, you can rearrange it to get a message directly from the universe. And what's even weirder, dude, is if you trace the past three eclipse pathways, they form a, a perfect freaking triangle over the United States of America. And if you look at this circle here, that's the true middle of this triangle. It's an untouched piece of land that humans have never made contact with. And what's crazy is if you zoom in on this true middle of the uh, triangle that the eclipse pathways create, you'll find this is the location where P. Diddy is hiding. <laughs> kind of brilliant, though. Is that one okay? It takes you on a journey. <laughs> it's like national treasure. <laughs> but is that one okay? Because... Yeah, Someone actually funny. sent that to me, and they're like, "I can't tell if this is a joke or not." I go, "Well, then we're in trouble." Yeah, no, but this is this is the next thing: is that the boundary between satire and reality is increasingly fuzzy. Yeah, which is not <laughs> great. Yeah. It's it, and it, you know now we got AI to deal with, and I saw someone posting the other day uh, a, a screenshot from Facebook, being like, "Oh, the boomers are just going to believe every AI." thing on facebook from now on and yeah. we are just so hooped because <laughs> the boomers are gonna go wait a second why is the pope in uh in a video on pornhub <laughs> like honest to god we're just not prepared for yeah for what ai, AI is scary does AI scary a little bit? Yeah, it do you does use, it, use chat gpt I, i've use never in my that. life i mean i use ai in the sense that i'm sure something i do is enhanced by ai like the gmail when gmail finishes your sentences i'm assuming that's ai yeah enhanced so i guess yeah. i must um but i've never used chat gpt or any any of the ai tools uh, I, I worry about it in a couple of ways i worry about it displacing workers and mm -hmm. i don't you know think we're prepared for that and i worry about the the mis and disinformation capacities for it like everybody mm -hmm. sort of does mm -hmm. because we're just not prepared for that and of course abuses you know like non-consensual sexual images and deep faking porn and things like that that's going to be used as a tool by creeps to to exploit people so uh, I, and, and again the law is so slow and and our institutions are slow so slow to catch up to this that's not looking do we have good. an update on the on the taylor swift stuff because that guy was uh, was from Ontario. Yeah, Toronto guy. He did the Taylor Swift deep deep fake porn, and yeah, she's uh, she actually had a law drafted. Uh, maybe the only pop pop star in the world that can have laws drafted. Don't mess with Taylor uh, Swift. 
Yeah, she's and she's got Congress gangster. on it. And then I don't know if you saw this the other day. AOC had one come out too. Alexander Ocasio Cortez. Say what you like about her, but again, uh, and she said it was unnerving to see it. Yeah. And it's and it's it's got to be right. Like for guys yeah. like us, like it it would be weird waking up one day to see someone who wanted to sewer our reputation uh, with us in a video, yeah. uh, like an adult pornography video. All of us would shit our pants. Yeah, right? of course we would. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we got to get on it. And I think, uh, incidentally, I think we actually were moving slightly faster on that than I would have expected, and uh, which is a good sign because we're often really slow on this, on harassment. The question will be, though. I have a theory on that. Once, uh, is it has to do with frogs? Probably. No, 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 no. no, no I, no, I, my, sorry, go ahead. Finish, finish, David. I, I, I will jump in with my theory on, on AI. Well, I was just thinking that my concern is, is we will, we'll get the laws, but will they be properly enforced? Because a lot of yeah. times you have a law in the yeah. books, and then someone is dealing with harassment and is dealing with someone deep faking their stuff or whatever, or stalking them or whatever it might be. And it's often typically women who have to deal with this, and then police and the courts. Right. They're yeah. just not there to enforce the law. So I am worried about the enforcement side of it, especially in the digital age where you could be hiding anywhere in the world behind a computer. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My yeah. theory uh, behind the reason why they've kind of stepped on the gas with this, this kind of thing and, and has to do with what was it about a year ago, Dean, when all the all those guys signed the paper and anybody working in AI, they were going to take a break or something, but yeah. they all got yeah. together. Yeah, they all said, hey, this is way too fast. All the big tech guys got together and said, we're going to sign an agreement that says uh, we're going to slow things down until we know how this is going to affect the world, et cetera, et cetera. And um, as soon so as it was about a year that, ago. Yeah, but I, I, did that, I think like Google and all those other companies just insulated their their research and started really going for it so one guy could get ahead of the other guy could get ahead of the yeah. other guy so it wasn't it like didn't work stopped no they didn't but i think i think somebody saw something somebody they were in a room and they were like hey look what we've done and and they invited all their buddies over and they all flew and they it went out to the strip club and then the next morning got on buses and went and checked it out and it scared them Somebody did something that scared somebody. And that's why I think that conversation started. And that's why I think there's been the conversation behind the scenes to get organized on possibly controlling this. That's my theory. And and again, it is a little conspiracy, you know, conspiracy. Yeah, that's the kind I can kind of broadly think of as plausible. Because I think even if it's not directly the case that they literally sat down and saw something that it is true that at the very least they detected a trend that scared them, right? When you have an expert coming out and saying, oh, there's a 10% that AI wipes out humanity in 10 years or 20 yeah. years or whatever it was, because as some guy did, I can't remember the details. Uh, that, that seems pretty high. 10% is pretty high. <laughs> like if I said, you know, there's a 10% chance you're going to crash your car on the way to the grocery store, you would think twice about getting in your car. Right. Yeah. So if I uh, told you there's a 10% chance you could win Lotto 649 or Lotto Max, you'd go I'd, buy a I'd, ticket. I'd buy a couple. Right. Yeah. And, and that 10% is a pretty high chance. Right. Yeah. When you, you're like, oh, 10%. But then I said, okay, there's a 10% chance you get in a car accident. All of a sudden you're like, that seems like that seems pretty I'll take the bus. Yeah. It's, it's, I, it's a, exactly. That's a high percentage chance for, for uh, a significant uh, event. So yeah. I, I do think, and I, and I worry that what's going to happen is the market's going to rush. And it's going to go where it goes and yeah. we're going to be really slow to restrain it. And by the time it gets to somewhere where we really don't want it to be like AI police robots, uh, which are in <laughs> development, uh, it's going to be too late because it, we've we're, we're there. Right. And then it's, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not going full blown Skynet here, yeah. but it's, it's, in the well, you can't because you don't like conspiracy it. theories. Uh, oh, it's yeah. like, and you know the funny part is, is that like all the people like us that are like terra firma, or at least you're terra firma and you're starting to believe some of these conspiracy theories uh, about you know eye in the sky, robot brain <laughs> controlling everything. It's legitimately here, right? So like you you almost have to you talk about moving the goalposts of what you can say or what you want to talk about in terms of and not giving a shit is one thing, but like 
everybody like us that it's like, ah, I got to see receipts proof. I want to see how this whole thing works. As you see this kind of stuff develop, you're like, well, now I, I need a new game plan when it comes to talking about this stuff because it's here in the conspiracy theories that we talk about, about, you know, machine learning taking over. If you've watched iRobot, I used to think iRobot was the stupidest movie of all time. Just a really big Bridget Moynihan fan, really big Bridget Moynihan fan. And now... Every time I see something on AI or every time I see, you know, something on Grok or you see Boston Dynamics put out a robot that can do somersaults or you see, you know, uh, uh, the, any, yeah, anything too. like that. You see BMW working on uh, this new robot. I don't know if you saw it. This robot that you can take with you, talk to you. It can empty the dishwasher for you. It can make you dinner. It's like it's truly frigging amazing. But it also is like. I didn't believe any of that shit. And all those conspiracy guys did way back in the day. And now it's mm. here. And now it's like, how do you not pay attention to that? Or at some point go, hmm, maybe we're wrong. And maybe we should be a little more open minded to the possibilities. Because it's like anything else, right? AI, new tech. The people that invent these things, they invent them because they want to see it work. It's like the mm -hmm. atomic bomb. And then you go, well, what have we done? Like, what have we done to the rest of the world with what we've decided to do? Because those and you spend a whole bunch of energy real. trying to find ways yeah. to um, placate yourself. And yeah. yeah. And well, you can imagine all kinds of past technologies that would have been thought of in some quarters as conspiracy theory, nutter stuff like a nuclear weapon or a plane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm sure there are people like, oh, yeah, yeah, the government is secretly working on a giant weapon that would destroy cities. And like, OK, Bill, put down the Jamesons, right? Yeah, <laughs> and then <laughs> I, I'll Shima. take it one step further. I I think what scared him was I think all those scientists AI guys got in a room, and um and somebody admitted we we can't turn it off. I'll just cut the power. No, no, we tried that. I I think I think we're already there. That's the sky. That's the Skynet conspiracy. I know it's the yeah, Skynet yeah, yeah. thing, and I realize be that careful because David won't be your friend. No, movie. I will because I, I mean. <laughs> Uh, I don't like I could imagine a world. Here's the thing. I can't imagine a world in which chemtrails are a thing. I can't imagine a world in which the Sandy uh, Hook folks were crisis actors. I can't imagine that world because that just that is not that is verifiably demonstrably untrue. Yeah. Right. Like that's that's demonstrably untrue. Yeah. What I can imagine, I can imagine a world in which a, a, a an AI technology gets out of our hands. Mm. I mean, I can. I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying it's there. I'm not saying it's happened. I'm just saying I can plausibly imagine that world, and I think that folks, you know, can 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 get there. Mm -hmm. And even working backwards from there, we get to the anxieties of of the of the power of AI, which currently isn't that AI on its own is a problem. It's that the humans controlling it have a dangerous tool that they can do dangerous things with yeah, and yeah, that the the ai threat point. isn't that ai will go rogue it's that people will do bad things with it which they absolutely will that is rule one it's like you invent yeah. a technology someone is going to do something bad with it you invent a hammer and someone is going to bash someone in the head with it right you yeah. invent uh you know nuclear power and someone's going to make a bomb out of it so, so we we just any it, it's law one of humankind you invent, you invent, you discover fire, and someone's going to eventually burn down a building with it for the insurance money. Like everything we do, eventually gets misused. Yeah, it's <laughs> so either, you can count it's on either it. yeah, we're either going to do <laughs> fire something the harmful. The insurance money is a good one. I bet the Neanderthals, when they're like, "Hey, well, this makes meat really tasty," weren't <laughs> thinking how they could screw over Wawanisa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's either that, and or yeah. we find a way to have they sex did. with it. Can yeah. you imagine a world, David, without the Big Turk? I don't want to. What's the really point of imagining? Upset. What's the point of imagining that? I, was really I have upset with you this week because you tweeted the, the most blasphemous shit. You talk about conspiracy theorists. I'm, your love for big Turks. Yeah, it's my it's my favorite chocolate bar. And here's I the thing: the I'm not Turks. saying it's the best chocolate bar in the world. I'm not saying everybody it's what you should said. love it. I was I was trying to be deliberately provocative. <laughs> Low stakes. Oh, were you gaslighting me? Is that right? <laughs> no, I would never. I love 
love, love the Big Turk chocolate bar. It is the perfect combination of a thin layer of chocolate and a good candy gooey layer. Yeah. And I don't even like the real Big Turk with like, if you were to take real Turkish delight and wrap yeah. it in chocolate, I'm like, no, I don't like that. I, although I like Turkish delight. I want the janky mass produced shitty chocolate, shitty Turkish yeah. uh, delight candy. And it was as a kid, it was my favorite chocolate bar. So yeah. I, this goes back to when I was like six years old. Okay, but I, and I get that. But were you introduced to chocolate bars by a senior citizen? That's the first question I would ask. I might have been. Okay. I don't actually remember. So my mom, I was raised by a single mom, yeah. and so when she would go to work, I would often go to my grandparents' house. So we may have yeah. the origin yeah, yeah. story here, because huh? I'd go, I'd you walk also down like to the Werther's. Factors. Yeah, and cherry blossoms. I do like cherries. No, I don't like I don't like cherry blossoms actually. <laughs> That's uh, a lie. You're just saying that to I, get out of the uh the no. I big fucking hate. Me Megan you really? loves cherry blossoms. I fucking hate cherry blossoms. They're the they fucking candy of all time. Is it? I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand how they still exist. But uh, I, I would. You know, I was funny. I tweeted about this a couple of years ago, and I got a big response. Was remember back in the day where your parents, your grandparents would give you a note, be like, "Oh, this is my grandson Dave. I'm sending him to Becker's here to get a pack of smokes." <laughs> please give him the smokes yeah and they'd be like okay and they would give the six-year-old like a pack of players yeah and then i would keep the change and buy myself a turkish delight or something like that like this is at six years old i'd walk down to the beckers grab my grandparents some smokes and a turkish delight <laughs> you imagine like now some kid walked in you kid. they won't let kids mail shit you can't like as a kid you're not like allowed to mail a package you can't like, walk into the liquor store and be like i need a Fifth 500 mil bottle of Jack <laughs> and a so pack funny, of smokes. So true. Like, did your yeah. grandparents say this was okay? Like, yeah, okay, then. Yeah, yeah. Here's a note. Here's a, here's a note from my. And it wasn't grandma, that long Mildred. ago, right? I would have been doing this in the early '90s or late yeah. '80s. Yeah, yeah, dude. It's the same thing. I remember my dad would say to me, "You'd get the call like at like six, seven o'clock at night." And my dad would call down the stairs because he'd have a couple drinks. He'd run out of rye. He'd send my brother and I to the corner store. The corner store where we lived had a liquor store next to it, right? So we'd give us a 20. He'd go get him a pack of smokes. That was two bucks. Bottle of rye was, and notes for both. Please give my son a two six of Canadian Club. <laughs> and I'm like, seven years old. Guys, like, What can I do? The kid's kid. got a note. I got a. He's got a note. I got no choice. <laughs> He's got a note. It was Saskatchewan too, so they would just take your word for it sometimes, right? They didn't I care. had a buddy one time, you know, when we were in high school, we I started getting served at the LCBO beer store in about a grade eleven. I had a beard, and uh, I had a buddy though whose strategy was <laughs> it's brilliant. He would walk into the liquor store with his health card that had his actual birth date on it that clearly showed he was under nineteen, and he would give it to them. And his hope was that they wouldn't look. <laughs> Are you serious? Because they can't confiscate your health card. <laughs> <laughs> they can't take it. It's not a fake ID. It's his. It's and it's his health card. They can't yeah. take it. Yeah. So he's just like, I, it's a numbers game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he played the odds. I want to know the numbers. It. Like and how it well? works sometimes. You know, yeah. like I don't like one in ten did. times. The people will be like, oh, good, you're good. They don't actually look at it. But I'm like, that's yeah. fucking brilliant. Yeah, dude, it, dude. Fake ID. It only needs to be fake ID if you can't, you know, play the odds as you pointed mm -hmm. out. That's all I did. I remember used to go across the border with my driver's yeah. license or my health card. Remember that? Remember you yeah, just when get, you, you didn't have passport. Yeah. In fact, I got across the border once with my student ID card. Mm. No word of a lie. This is back in the nineties, late late nineties, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. Thanks, Obama or Osama. Thanks a lot. I grew up in BC. It was eighteen was the drinking yeah. age, yeah. and so before we turned eighteen, we'd go to the states to buy booze. Yeah. Um, and they'd give it to us no problem. And it was 21 down there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah. We, we, that's how we negotiated drinking when we were kids, like grade 11, grade 10, grade 11. Grade it's nine, nice that we figured out how eight. it is you came to love Big Turks, though. That was the only thing I really wanted to figure out because it bothered me on Twitter the other day. That's my day. origin story. I yeah. know it is. It what about sense. an Eat More? Where do you stand on an Eat More? David? You know, when I was in high school, uh, I loved Eat Mores and I still wouldn't mind an eat, an eat More. I like it's different, right? It's chewy. It's uh, yeah. this toffee thing. It's yeah. you know, peanuts, yeah. I think, are kind of an overrated nut, but it's an interesting combination. You know what the worst chocolate bar is? No joke. That people love and I don't understand it. Mars yep. bars. Big, 
Mars oh, bars? I, I can are do a Mars bar. Are you kidding me? Mars bars are okay. Big They're Turks. Terrible. Big Turks eat Mars Mars bars. Mars bars. I don't know What's anybody that would take a Mars, a Mars bar or a Big Turk or an eat more over Mars bar. Nobody. Yeah, I know. You I'd take would. an eat more over a Mars bar. Mm-hmm. We've already discovered. Or why. Snickers. Snickers, I think, is the per- is the platonic idea of a chocolate bar. It's the perfect chocolate bar. It's 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 perfectly designed and balanced. Uh, and Mars is kind of like a shittier version of a Snickers. Yeah, it's like an empty Snickers. Like I, I yeah. get that. I, I get what you're it's saying. Nuts we're, up in there. Worry up with. Worry up. Worry up with Kit Kats. Worry up with Kit Kats. Oh, I love Kit Kats. I, I love Kit Kats. And, and Kit-Kats, I would yeah. I, when I, I've been to Japan a couple of times, and I just come back with a suitcase full of exotic Kit Kats because they've got matcha all Kit Kat, or matcha, matcha Kit-Kat. butter, butter Kit Kat, butter Kit Kat. Are you kidding me right now? Butter Kit Kats, very good. Really, I had no idea. They also have the crazy get, but... Doritos over there too. Oh. Like they'll have like a like a wasabi Dorito. Like yeah, oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. It's, yeah. yeah, that's a real that's a real country. Where where you at? That's with, a real uh, country. Yeah, right. Where you at with O Henry's? No, no bueno. Oh no, I like O Henry's, especially if they're cold. I like to put them in the fridge or the freezer and eat them cold. Mm. That's that's not many people do that anymore. That's what I do with score bars. Yeah, um, oh, I love score bars. Cool. Yeah, score, score bar. You can't not put a score bar in the freezer. Yeah. Like if score you're going to score bar room temperature, you're yeah. an idiot. You score can't is close. You know what? Now I think about score is right up there. Yeah, it's really simplicity. Um, where are you at with caramel? That's ranked the number one chocolate bar in this country. Caramel, and I is it's it really? like bottom feeder for me. Yeah, absolutely. Caramel. I like and the caramel. Jersey milk. Strangely enough, Jersey milk made the cut. That's Which like I thought mid. was ridiculous. Caramel's I don't know anybody fine. that stops and gets a Jersey milk. I don't dislike milks, but they're kind of mid, right? Yeah. Yeah, they are very mid, aren't they? Fascinating. Anyway, I'm just happy to know why you like Big Turks. I'm not going to mock you now because I know it comes with emotional Caramel's are kind of like Paul Rudd. <laughs> like, no one's going to... No one's going to get really angry about it, but like... Yeah. yeah. You're not giving Caramel an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he has one. I don't know, but he probably he, if he if he does, he should. He does, I, don't I don't know why that works, David. That <laughs> he's a fucking doctor. That's why it works. He he just it comes yeah, to him and he has the information. Trust me, he's That's a doctor. Awesome. Yeah, the the challenge here is really just controlling the traffic flow. This is it's funny because this is a thing I realized when I was young was that my brain worked a lot faster than my mouth mm. and my. <laughs> Uh, and so things would just sort of tumble out and, and I would have a hard time catching myself before I said things. Mm-hmm. And 90% of the time that was fine. And 50% of the time it was actually a huge asset, but 10% of the time it got me into a lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. And one of my first political Sounds memories, like my life. It, it it's a problem, right? And, and one of my first political memories was when I was in grade Five, I think, and it was during the Quebec referendum in '95. And my teacher was French Canadian. I can't remember if she was Quebecois or Franco Ontarian. I think she was Quebecois. And we had this big map up on our wall in the, in the portable, and she was taking it down. It was a map of Canada, and she was taking it down province by province. And she took Quebec down, and I said something like, "You would." <laughs> And I was like, I don't know, how old are you in grade five, 10 or something like that? Yeah, 11, like nine or You're 11, yeah. And so I'm You're just 11. old enough to kind of get that that's a joke and it's political and it's, but I got in so much shit for that. I just didn't think about why anyone would have a problem with that until I got dreamed out for it. And I'm like, I'm like an 11 year old, I don't know. And so and that's when my first, like my, the Quebec referendum is my first political memory, really yeah. my first real wow. political memory. And, uh, but, but since then it's been a problem. And so it's what, what makes podcasts and, and streams like this really interesting is that things are going through my head as we talk and I'm trying to process and put them all through the checks. Is this true? Is this fair? Is this libelous? Is this scandalous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before I say something. And, mm-hmm. and so like, by the time I'm done, it very, it seems very laid back and very calm and just shooting the shit. But by the time I'm done, I look like, uh, like, uh, Doc from Back to the Future, just like smoke pouring out of your head. Yeah, it's the hard part now too, right? Like we live in, we're going back to our original conversations um, about canceling people and and guarding what you say. 
because you don't want to offend any group, right? Being a journalist is difficult that way because, you know, now we're asked to serve a certain audience. We're not asked to write creatively. We're not, you know, you know this by the the independent work that you do for the several publications that you work for. You put up an article at uh, TVO today, which is incredible. I encourage everybody to go and read it. Uh, if you haven't, uh, Doug Ford's government is hands off unless they're not, uh, which is fascinating, except when it's not, governments have a duty to govern within the limits of democratic best practices. The Tories don't seem to be too concerned about that. It's a tremendous article. If you get a chance to go and write it or go and read it, it's on David's, it's on TVO's website. It's on David's Twitter feed as well. But it must be difficult for you because it's difficult for me in your discipline when you write. And I know it's difficult for Lachlan because you see, if your brain works a certain way, you see all kinds of content coming from oh, yeah. one subject, right? But then yeah. you have to do something, and I don't know how you do it, but really disciplined journalists, smart cats, have the ability to meter their emotional response yeah. within what it is that they deliver. And you do become emotional. Yeah, it's <laughs> mine too. It's all of ours, right? You got to pick your pitches. How? How do you do it? Practical wisdom. I, I, I That seems flippant, but I, it's true. I mean, I, I wish we had... I was just talking about this yesterday, actually, on a stream. I, I wish we had more grace in the sense that sometimes people say things that, that are deeply hurtful that they shouldn't say. But if they were acting in good faith, then we should have the grace to forgive them and move on. But that's not what happens. You get branded with a scarlet letter in perpetuity. Some people are total shit heels and they are recurring offenders and they operate in bad faith. That's a different problem. Those folks are are a different problem. They're trolls, they're abusers, they're a different thing. But a lot of good faith people say something dumb or say something without thinking or on the fly and then that becomes their life. And that's a big problem because there's mm -hmm. no forgiveness there. And go back to Hannah Arendt. Uh, she's somewhere over one of my shoulders. And, you know, Hannah Arendt writing in the, the post-war era was saying that, you know, we need promise and forgiveness. We need promise because it binds us together and allows us uh, to have some stability in the world. But we also need forgiveness because we're human beings and we're fallible. And at some point, we're going to fail to fulfill our promises and we need the grace uh, to forgive. Mm -hmm. And we don't do promise and forgiveness. And that leads to a much more toxic and problematic um, world, right? And, and everyone's a little mm -hmm. worse off for it. So I try to be very careful and, and apply kind of Aristotelian virtue ethics of knowing what to say, when to say, and how to say it. Because if you pick your pitches, you can get away with saying real things in, in real ways. Mm. But you got to really be careful. And I have a couple of heuristics. And one of them is, am I punching up or down? Mm. Mm -hmm. And if I'm punching up, then I'm a lot less worried than if I might be punching down. And if I'm punching mm. down, I'm probably not going to say it. And if I get called out for missing it, I own it. I apologize. I think about it. And I move on with my life. And I find that if you operate in good faith, there is some hope that if you have a track record of it, you will be given that forgiveness and grace. Uh, but it's certainly not extended universally. Mm, no, uh, and it's a great point. You know, we have so many different people that have different opinions. And, uh, you know, we have spent the better part. And we talked about this in the podcast yesterday, David. Uh, you know, we've spent the better part of like three years looking for people and things to dunk on. Right. Like it's just a, like we said that earlier. It's just a dunk yeah. fest. And we mentioned the emotional part and the damage that it does to you when you're negative, right? It, it, you, you and I have both talked about this. We talked about it earlier in the podcast, having to take a break from the negativity. And I go back to the philosophical tenet of what's bad for the hive being bad for the bee. I mentioned that a lot. And, and I've never experienced that in as much as I have over the past three years. And it comes from this emotional response that we all have, right? From the content that we put on, from the values that we hold dear, uh, and then, you know, being able to fight through the emotional response to have some sort of intellectual response where you can be of good character and whatever you put out in terms of content can be for the common good doesn't seem to get clicks anymore. Right. It's not the rewarding process. It's one not what we have on social media. The algorithm doesn't work that way. And I see it in analytics. And that's the anger. Or that's the that's the piece that I think a lot of people in this space, in your space, that are doing this work, you have to ask yourself that question at one point, you know, are you doing this for a lift and a response? Yeah. Or are you doing this because you know, you're doing the right thing? Are you doing this because are you putting that information out because you believe this is the best of yourself and the best interpretation of that? And can you 
which is something we have not done a good job of and something we've endeavored to do to your point. And Brittle Star made me aware of it when he's like, uh, you know, don't 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 hate the messenger, hate the message. Right. Mm. Don't go after the people who are kettled by the messaging. Yes. Go after the people who are delivering that messaging and radicalizing and brainwashing those people on any side of the aisle. Go after the institution, not the human being, to your point. And, you know, as much fun as it is to get that lift from punching down and maybe being right in terms of it's amazing. And I've noticed the damage that it has done to me over the past three years. Mm -hmm truly done to me and my psyche and my ability to enjoy my life or even be able to open up Twitter and to open it up and to compete in Twitter by going like this. Every time you do it at nine o'clock at night, you're like, here we go. Right. It's that feeling. You got to ramp up to it. And that's the stuff that existentially I can't do anymore. And I wonder if we as a people are going to be at that point, or if the algorithm is going to continue to reward. We are getting there. We're getting there. I'd like to think so. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to think so. I don't know. If I'd like are. to add one more thing to the to, the, to, the, stuff to the pile. No, it's not the frog thing. Okay. Um, I think gratitude is severely lacking as well in um, not just this space, but in general. Um, yeah, that actually taking the time to to thank the people, even if it's something that they might not necessarily feel like they need to have gratitude. Mm -hmm. for. Anyway, we're not a very happy people. I'll tell you that. Although no. David is. And I, I am actually pretty happy. I was thinking about this recently. I'm like, yeah, I am. It's kind of like level. Everything's good. Good. <laughs> it's, as it's, long as he's got a big Turk. It's very strange. You know, it's funny is because I had years of, of anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it's such a classic trope of, well, what happens if it goes away? Like, then you're just going to feel better. Now, like my, my, my current self would be like, well, dummy, you'll feel better. But myself then was so bound up in it. And I'm like, well, does it take your edge off? You know, are you worse mm. at writing? Are you worse at, you know, like, no, you're just better. <laughs> Good for you. You just, you just feel better. But the things just leveled out. And, uh, and now things are just, you know, it's funny because at once the world is falling apart in so many small and medium and big ways and i'm very anxious about that and worried about that and and apprehended with that mm -hmm. but then day to day my life is just good and stable mm -hmm. and it's a very interesting dynamic because it's it's a bit like the this is fine meme <laughs> yeah everything's fine yeah. but yeah. you know like day to day I, I get up i like my life i love my partner i love our dog who's chilling here beside me i love my work we're moving, you know, we love our new house. It's like, damn. Life's pretty good. Life's just good. Yeah, but you don't, you have the ability to look outside, you know, and, and know that that the internal parts are the rewarding parts, right? The relationships. Yeah, you know, that was the big lesson. Mind. Yeah. <clears throat> that was the big lesson. Was it the external stuff? Not chasing? It was, it was, you know, it's funny as I know you're, you're deeply embedded in the stoic tradition, but I remember from even a long time ago would turn to stoicism in, in tough times and read it to kind of reorient myself and Epictetus and, and Marcus Aurelius in particular. And and stoicism is so fraught because there's a lot of hucksters who've picked it up and and mm -hmm. given it a bad name in some ways. But if you go to primary texts and really and there's kind of there's kind of a bro culture around it, which sometimes isn't the healthiest. But there's also a deep tradition there that that is incidentally deeply Buddhist as well, right? There's a lot of Buddhist elements to that that are really productive. And if you go and sit with that and think about it and really engage with it, it, it is a solve in a lot of ways. And I think I've, you know, I, I turned, I, I moved away from it consciously in, all, in, in recent years because I haven't been in, in any sorts of crises where I need to go into it. But then I realized that I've actually come to it kind of obliquely mm. in the turning away from it, which if you think about it is in itself very stoic. <laughs> Almost very much so yeah and, and so it just ended up working because i'm gonna sort of click and then i you know got myself right through that process and it's been deeply rewarding and it's funny because i don't even sit around thinking oh when's the other shoe gonna drop or when's it all gonna fall apart i'm just sort of there thinking oh i like getting up hanging out petting the dog taking the dog for a walk walking to the coffee shop writing coming home hitting the gym reading it's like it's just nice and level mm -hmm. and i'm in those moments Mm. And uh, and it, like if you're lucky enough to have everything aligned, and and if you're smart enough to do the work and commit enough to do the work, 
there's a there's a chance it really pays off and that's it's mm. been quite nice good for my you issue, I, my issue with stoicism has been i met too many people that adapted it and then used it at not you dean thank you used it as a weapon or yes. license to yeah. be an asshole yes yeah. or to, or to point out that they don't have to care you know, and I think that that's Dang, the yes. biggest problem. That's nihilism, no, right? Like this is totally, yeah, and that's nihilism. nihilism. And this is the fact. This is the battle is to say there's a big difference between stoicism and nihilism, and 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 we've got to we've got to know that. Well, and stoicism is funny because, um, you know, as as someone who has had a problem with alcohol that I talk about regularly, um, you know, stoicism was that extra thing, you know, that 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 gave me some kind of ability to have reason choice with my own life around and the things that happen around me and it, and it helped me separate myself from the actions of others yeah and it also helped me separate my mind from the mob's mind right like it helped me get away from going okay well this is how society works you need to be part of these groups and you really don't you know you don't have to be part of anybody's group you have to have the ability to reason, right? And when you're emotional, you don't. And stoicism, you know, there's a reason why people go, oh, that guy's very stoic. And it comes with this adaptation that everybody that follows stoicism has this, this otherworldly calm, or they're not interested in living life, or they're not fun, or they're not interested. And it's not the case. When you see someone who has really wrapped their heart around the idea that you're responsible to respond to everything in your life in your best interest in the best way possible. And that you can separate your mind from the minds of others. And Epictetus once said that he said, and a wonderful philosopher, broken leg. He was a slave. It's an imaginary story. It's truly uh, fascinating. He's considered the, the slave or the peasant philosopher. And one of the things that he said that sticks with me today, and I say it all the time to people that I work with, it's, you know, if, if someone passed by and gave you to somebody else, you'd be furious. But you give your mind to people on a regular basis. You allow them in your head. You allow their words to hurt you and you internalize these things because of one reason, one reason only. You don't have the ability to respond properly. You don't yeah. know what the best interest of that response is for you. And repeat it over time. I don't know of any better text. I don't know of any better um, philosophy or life philosophy that gives you that ability to be able to kind of captain your life and understand that everybody around you is going through the same thing you're going through, but you don't have to go through it with them. You know what I mean? That you have that ability to remove yourself from it and truly just do life, like just do your life. And here's the other thing. I understand that failure is my greatest teacher now. I don't get mm -hmm. jacked up by it. Uh, other people's words don't mean anything to me unless I respect the person's words that are saying those things mm -hmm. to me, right? So through the process of being able to understand what stoicism is, to your point, it's given me this ability to get away from my emotional self, react emotionally all the time, negatively all the time, to be able to sit back and say, what is going on in front of me and how do I respond to this in the best way possible? And that is it for me. That is why I, I, I am what I am. And that led to, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. Donald J. Mm -hmm. Robertson, who's a, a great friend and mentor of mine, I'll send you the Stoic series that we did with him a little while ago. Um, and I encourage everybody to look into any kind of mental practice, any kind of cognitive practice where you make these repeated decisions in the best interest of your life to respond well to failure, to respond well to success, and to embrace it all. Embrace mm -hmm. it all is this beautiful experience because we're in the business of doing this life, right? We're not in the business of staying in their covers. We're not in the business of being scared. We're in the business of competing in the Republic with people in the marketplace of ideas. And when you feel confident enough to do that as an individual, you realize that all the other stuff doesn't matter. What matters is those relationships that you have. What matters is the people that you love. And what matters is surrounding yourself with those things. And that becomes your karma. That becomes a happy life. And not yeah. many people understand that, David. And it's nice that you do. It's a hundred percent. And, and like shit just doesn't bother me anymore. Like it used to. And I've tried to help myself. So there's one thing to do the mental work. It's another, you can set up institutional setups to try to help you. So for instance, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. It's actually very important for my work, uh, like it or not, both for, for sharing the stuff I write, but also for reading the work of others, which I think is the more important of the two for me. Uh, but I've limited what I see. Right. Like, you know, Odysseus lashes himself 
um, to the to the masts while going past the sirens for a reason. And uh, for instance, I don't see comments from people who don't follow me. I don't see comments from new accounts. I don't see comments from people with default avies. And it's made my Twitter experience a lot better. It's made it easier not to take things seriously or to get inundated with that. Mm -hmm. And it's a sort of like almost like a training wheels for not caring about stuff. And I and I'm uh, for, for not caring about bad faith attacks or, or unreasonable sure. attacks. Uh, good ones make me think. Bad ones wash over me. And it's made a big difference. And then. You know, when when I I go out in the day and you argue with people and you get criticized and sometimes from people you you care about and, and really respect and that gets to you a little bit because you're a human being and you got to process that. But then I ground myself in the moment. I go play video games with my friend. I go play sports with my team. I hang out with Megan on on the couch and we watch a show and you know. Uh, we, I take the dog for a walk and then I'm there and mm -hmm. I'm not over, you know, it's funny is walking the Sam who's touring around behind me because she can't get in her little crate. Uh, you can kind of see her right there. Yeah, there she is. She's so she's, pretty. She's a very good Sam. Sam. <laughs> she wants to go in the crate. You want to put yeah. her in the crate? She's got crate envy she, right now. She's got, yeah. Cause that's, this is her way of her, her way of chilling out. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'll open that door in a sec. But uh, you know, I take her for a walk, and because she's leash reactive, uh, I have to be very conscious of. You should always be conscious when you're walking a pet. But because she's reactive, I'm extra conscious. So my phone is in my pocket, and I don't touch it. I'm I've got my hand on the leash, two hands on the leash, and I'm paying attention to to Sam. And it's just me and Sam out walking around. That's such a simple thing, but it's also a deep expression of being there in the moment. Mind I'm out walking yeah. the dog. I'm mindful of walking the dog. It's me and her hanging out doing, you know, having some exercise and me walking, you know, looking around to make sure that she's comfortable and, and not anxious and she doesn't scare anyone else. And you're there in a moment and everything else melts away. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I think to myself, I need to bring the dog walking mentality to every little bit of my life to be mm. present in that moment and focus on that thing and when you're in that moment you're in a kind of peace and and it's a skill that i think that is really worth putting the time in to develop how do you how do you separate this is a question i'll ask you before we let you go um how do you separate and this is the question that i get from a lot of people uh how do you separate being mindful right from not caring about certain things how do you separate because because there's a difference Mm -hmm. You know, when you're mindful and being in the moment, you need to be in the moment where you're on Twitter like you. It's very good for our business. Right. Yeah. And you're like, I need to be mindful in that. But when we're mindful, we take things very seriously. Like you took that moment to be mindful with your dog in that moment to enjoy your life, to experience this, your life experience in a, in a very, you know, holistic um, it feeds your soul when you do those things. It doesn't feed your soul on Twitter, but you need to be mindful when you're on Twitter. So how do you explain that to somebody who's like, wait a second, you want to be all in, but now you're saying you can't give a shit about what other people are saying or doing. That's the separation of that emotional self, right? From that moment. I, I would say that it is, it, there's a slight distinction of importance, which is you, you do need to care the appropriate amount in the appropriate way. Again, this is a very kind of Aristotelian virtue ethics approach is that it's not about not caring. It's about a caring the right amount in the right way. Mm -hmm. So if someone I really respect has a critique of something I've said or done, uh, then I'm going to try to sit with that and think about it. I'm going to care about it. I'm going to process it. If I think they've got a point, I'm going to change my behavior. Uh, that's and then I'm going to move on with my life and do better. That's a caring about it in the right way, uh, in a constructive way, in an appropriate way, in the right amount. If some internet troll says you're a commie fuck bag, I hope you die in a fire. <laughs> that I'm not going to care about because there's no reason to care about. There's nothing to take away from. There's no there there. I move I move on with my life. Yeah. And so it's about being attentive to what you should care about it and to the amount you should care about it and to adjust accordingly if there's something to adjust because it's information about the world that can help you to become a better person. Mm -hmm. And the wisdom is knowing what to pay attention to and how much and what not to and having the capacity to leave it behind when you need to leave it behind so you can move on to the next thing because to, to your earlier point if i get into a, a twitter fight with someone and i get a little bit irritated which does happen and then i go to go hang out with my friends or go to hang out with megan i'm not served 
by bringing that frustration and that anger mm. into that moment over there. In fact, it it then if I take that with me, then it ruins you know this other moment that might be special or nice or or so. Um, you're, not whether, you're, you're not present because you're taking it with you. So that and you're, point, and you're yeah. unhappy and it's yeah. like ruins everything. So <clears throat> you know it's about about dealing with a thing in the moment. Uh, if you need to deal with it, not dealing if you don't, and then moving on so you can go enjoy another part of your life, uh, which you then will take something else from. And mm. I find that I've gotten pretty good at that in general, right? But that's I, practice, right? That stuff behind it. It is, it is 100% practice. Yeah. It, I, I think there's two components to it. One is the institutional setup component. So mm -hmm. if there are ways to limit the extent to which this stuff can get to you through through strategies and tactics, do that. Like having Twitter filters, having control over who can talk to you, how they can talk to you, quitting accounts if they're truly deeply toxic and hurtful to you, right? If they're not if they're not a net positive, uh, things like that. And having time where you don't touch your phone, whatever. There's 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 structural ways, but then there's psychological ways of disciplining yourself over time and being gentle with yourself because it's tough, it takes a long time, sure um, and forgiving yourself, <clears throat> and you'll never be perfect. Accepting that, but then saying. I'm just going to leave this here. And when I move over here, I'm going to uh, forget this and I'm going to talk to my partner. I'm going to talk to my buddies. I'm going to go play a video game with them mm -hmm. and I'm going to focus on this thing that I'm doing. And then in the act of focusing on this other thing, what you find is this other stuff that's over here intruding in your brain uh, dissipates. <clears throat> It just it just goes away because you only have so much focus. Now, if you're having intrusive thoughts and ruminations and things that you have a really deeply structural hard time, there might be something else going on there. You 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 know I, I do very much support people talking to professionals and and medicating when necessary, but th for me that that wasn't what did it. I, I mm -hmm. never did medication for different reasons. I did therapy for lots of reasons. But what eventually got me there was disciplining myself and learning how to check that, leave it, and move on mm -hmm. and focus on the where I am in the moment. Uh, and that did a lot of good. But that mm -hmm. does take time and practice. And that's what's worked for me. That may not work for everyone, but I can tell you it's it works for a lot of people. And, and it, I'm one of them. It, it does. You know, there, there, there's an intellectual quotient, and I'll be nice about it. Like, you have to understand what it means and how to be able to discipline yourself, right? Like, there's, there's a difference between, you know, what you can download and how you can actually download that and institute those, you know, checks and balances, whether it comes to massaging, you know, the inputs in your life and the outputs in your life, knowing that you're going to have to get rid of certain friends who aren't good for you. It's that control aspect. The dichotomy yep. of control in stoicism is the dichotomy of control in everybody's life. What do you control and what do you not? And it's amazing how angry I've allowed myself, we've all allowed ourselves to get over the words that we've not don't control from other people that they put out there that we felt like we wanted to control. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you realize that one thing, right? Is that I cannot control what that person said to me, what that person did to me. I can only control my response to that person. And when you realize that response doesn't have to come in the form of go fuck yourself, you dick bag. It can come in the form of a block. It can come in the form of a mute. Mm -hmm. It can come in the form of you just deciding you just it literally can. When you, when you repeat that behavior enough, it can come in the form of deciding that you're not going to be affected by it. You're not going to allow Johnny 699 uh, to tell you that you're a pedophile and allow that to bother you throughout your entire day because you don't control it. You yeah. don't. And I see so many people, David, waste their time chasing things they don't control. And I was that guy. To your point, five years ago, if someone did what they did to me yesterday where they rode their bike up next to me on Bay Street, had a smoke hanging out of their mouth, spit on my window, told me to get out of their lane. I laughed five years ago. I would have chased the guy down and ruined my entire day and maybe gotten charged. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, one of those like crazy responses that I would not be in control of because it was an emotional response today. I looked at that gentleman and in my mind through a series of, you know, years and years and years of practice, I said to myself, that guy has no other options in life. Yeah. Poor fella. And I went about my day and it didn't bother me for more than four seconds because it had nothing to do with me. That was him. But we allow people that space in our lives. And that is something I'm unwilling to do. And so that practice over seven years, to your point, someone who was medicated, someone who was uh, diagnosed with PTSD and extreme anxiety and first episode depression, like the bad stuff, didn't know I had it. And I'll tell you what fixed me. It wasn't medication. It was the, it was the work. It was the work involved 
of deciding I need to be a better person. Historically, where do I find examples of people who were able to be that better person? And what do I have to do? What are those repeated steps? What are those steps in my life I have to bring in, which is surround myself with people I want to be like, which is why I love having you on the show. I want to be like David Moscroft. I want to be who like Who doesn't? I Nobody mean, I know doesn't want to do Everybody wants to be David Moscroft. Let me look at this thing. But we surround ourselves with people who teach us about grace, wisdom, kindness, all those mm-hmm. things that we go, man, that guy, you see that guy, I want to be like that guy. He seems so peaceful and he deals with life in such a proper way and he seems successful. Guess what that guy did? Same thing we did, that work, right? It's There's no magic bullet. There's no flip, the switch we flip on. And I, when I see people that, that don't want to do the work of being that better person, don't want to do the work of reading, opening themselves up to the idea that other people had ideas of how to be better, happier people before we decided to fuck it up with the internet. I keep Marcus Aurelius close. I can actually. Meditations? What do you got? I've got a very nice edition of, of the meditations that I keep. It's the folio edition mm-hmm. that I keep. Very close. And like once every couple of years, I go and read it. The whole uh, thing? It's Back got front. drawings. Oh, it's got illustration. The Hayes, the Hayes uh, edition, the Hayes translation is one of the best. If you get the, the Hayes translation of meditations, it's really good. It breaks down what you have to do. And you know the amazing part of that book? The first like two chapters is him thanking people for making yes. him who he was. Yeah, his tutors. His, yeah. <laughs> Right? I'm more on the medication path still, and <laughs> I'm a big fan of alcohol solving all my yeah. problems. Yeah, and, it uh, yeah, but you Thank guys, you, you guys look great. Thank you. You guys look yeah, like you're doing fantastic. It. We are. We're happy people. David Moskrop, uh, his Substack. I would encourage everybody to subscribe to it. He is uh, one of those culture leaders that uh, just does what he does, and by a product of it, he's, he's just guy. one of those cats. Yeah, he's uh, dude. Absolutely love having you on the show. Too dumb for democracy is the name of the book. I believe it's in his fourth printing, third printing. Fourth yeah, printing? three or four, something like that. It's Where still at? going strong. That's awesome. Uh, it's yeah, one of the best books. It's it's again historical. If you like history and if you like seeing people repeat mistakes, and if you want someone to usher you through what democracy should be, David Moskrop is your guy. He's got a couple of great articles up at TVO right now. Uh, we didn't get a chance to take out Doug Ford's knees today. Sorry, we'll dude. Do it next time. Do another time. Yeah. yeah. Will you come back? Yeah. Uh, anytime. All right, buddy. Have a great day. Good you to see you, David. Thanks so much. David Moskrop, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. David Moskrop. One of my favorite people. You know what I like about him? Not only is he smart, he delivers a smart, but he doesn't make you feel like an idiot when he talks doesn't to you. Doesn't punch down. No. Doesn't spend his day dunking on people. He's I've been telling just trying you. trying to figure out the craziness. Don't, don't, don't. Don't. You just got to just blow 35 <laughs> minutes of stoicism out your ass. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I, I looked at your go. face when he brought it I up, and it I'm go. like, yes. I let it wow. go. Dude, do you want to be as successful as us? You should get into stoicism. I'll send I'm you very this. successful. I have I have, uh, I have, have everything that I need. You do. Right here, right? Yeah. Yes. Under that Ardent Roof Systems hat, by yes. the way. Excellent product placement, Ardent Roof Systems, proud partner of the Dean Blundell Show with Lachlan Cross out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, the number one Owens Corning guaranteed platinum partner in all of North America. We got one of the yours. Owens Corning guys on the show, actually, wow. very, very soon. We yep. we will have that person on very soon. So Art and Roof Systems brings you the locker room retro replay of the day. This one kind of speaks for itself. I do want to remind people that the early bird pricing is still in effect for the Arden Roof Systems Charity Golf Tournament that helps out the Stollery Life Stollery Child Life Program. He's raised sixty five thousand dollars. We just got the okay wow. from yeah in four years, four tournaments, wow. sixty five thousand dollars, which has gone a long way to do some very cool things at the hospital, which we are going to in May get a chance to go down and film and give you a look at where your money, if you sign up for the tournament, is going. Again, early bird pricing in April. It'll end on May 1st. Go check out the webpage. Easy to find the link to sign up for the golf tournament. It is artroofsystems.com. Yeah. The Lock the Lock, 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 lock play. I need to be busy. Mm. And I don't think that that's going to like stop when I'm 65. Plus, could you imagine you and your wife hanging out all day, every day? Yes, Grant. <laughs> 
Oh, is she listening right now? Is that the look you're giving me? I can totally see that. The more time I get to spend with my wife, the better. <laughs> All it'll do is strengthen our relationship. Hi, Deb. You're obviously listening. Why do you do that to me? What? Uh, <laughs> you, dude, you, you have no idea how hard you telegraph that whole thing. <laughs> right. You're, home, right. you're You're like kind of retired right now, 53, looking like a million bucks. Going to get your yoga 54. teaching certificate, 54. Never look better. You got a great shitter on you, too. Good little old man ass on you. Yeah. And now you're home with the wife. You have been for like a month and a half. How are things? I don't want to get into it's, a long It's been but going she, well, but there have been moments where she has said to me, maybe up. you should go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, yeah, it, yeah, honey, you really it. should go out with Buck. Don't you have a hockey game to go to tonight? You really, Dude, really, gonna, really, really should go out with buy, Buck. She's gonna buy you. He's your friend. Every <laughs> she's gonna buy you tickets to every Oiler playoff game. I don't and go to the Oilers games. I know you don't, I don't because have you don't like paying for them. But well, no, 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 she, no. You have no idea. She's gonna say. Honey, look, it's I, insane I, how much. How much are playoff tickets? I pff, I don't even I wouldn't even look at it. Like I would need a second mortgage. The amount of money people like spend on hockey. Grand. Yeah, yeah. Four, yeah. Grand here. Listen, um, I'm gonna let you go because yeah. if I don't, I'm gonna pee my pants. Me too. But, uh, I'm yes. All right. Um, we'll see you in a bit. All Thank right. you Lachlan's for today. Gotta go pee. Great to see yes. you. Lock and cross, ladies and gentlemen. At Lock and Cross on Twitter, one of the greatest people you'll ever meet. Seriously. There you go. That's it for the podcast. Have a wonderful day. RIP OJ, I guess. I don't know. I don't care that he's dead. I know. Everybody's like, oh, you're like, no, no. I look at death differently, especially when it's a psycho that murdered a couple people. Bon voyage, fuckface. Uh, thanks to everybody for being part of the show, including and not limited to our friends at Can Torque. They make rugged, hardworking torque wrenches uh, for heavy industry around the world, not just in Canada. They manufacture in Canada, but uh, they also manufacture for uh, nuclear, railroad, mining, uh, boring tunnels, anything that requires a bolting solution you can't find because the bolts are too big or they're in there too hard or no one can do it because the torque wrench doesn't have enough PSI. Well, they make the best in the world. Uh, and every solution under one roof, from tool rentals, calibration, and much, much more. Uh, fabrication, every product you can check out at their new website, cantork.com. Also, you can check out all their services and brand new podcasts called Talk and Torque with Colin Livingston. He's the principal, and he's been at this for 20 years. He's either in Dubai or China, or he's in the oil fields in Alberta, or he's on an oil rig somewhere in the middle of the ocean providing torque wrench solutions for people who need them in a big, bad way, and he's the best in the world at it. So go to cantork.com for more details proudly manufactured in canada by canadians for heavy industry around the world rugged hard-working torque wrenches canada's leading industrial tool experts the best in sales service calibration maintenance and custom fabrication of industrial torque tools go to cantorque.com for more information also brought to you by our friends at muse massage spa and their brand new podcast called muse on the mic the latest one is all about whacking it yeah just let's put it right out there there's no need in in mincing words uh and these girls are advocates for the sex work industry they own muse massage spa they have a podcast which encourages all kinds of education in the sexology uh, uh, arena in the body work arena in the sex work arena and they know more about sex work than anybody else because they've been there and now they're entrepreneurs who like to help women make money in this area and in this industry and there's nothing more safe or therapeutic and going to Muse Massage Spa for that $50. Just ask for the Dean deal. Make sure you get them on DM. And not just done there. Emily and Riley have a great podcast called Muse on the Mic. Uh, and you can get that podcast uh, at Patreon. You can subscribe to it. That's the juicy version. You know what I mean? Because it's not censored. That's why it's on Patreon. Highly suggest you go and subscribe to that. You can also get the YouTube version, Muse on the Mic, and go to Muse Massage Spa for more details. And we're brought to you by our friends at Fact Check as well. Factcheck.io is robust software that will kill disinformation before it starts or even after it starts. Could be a picture, could be a video, could be a news story, anything with a URL. Anything that someone tells you is something and you want to question the veracity of that, you want to verify it, 
Fact Check does it all for you. They're now accepting beta applicants to test their software. Go to factcheck.io to sign up, F-A-K-T-C-H-E-K.io. If you would like some agency over what you read, see, feel, hear, and touch, watch, doesn't matter what it is. A group of scientists, journalists have gotten together and they said, bleep that. Let's create something that not only tracks, but gives people a full report. They can make the decision themselves based on the best available information, not just a headline. It's what they do. Go to factcheck.io today to sign up for the beta test, F-A-K-T-C-H-E-K.io. Saw the beta again yesterday. <laughs> it's crazy. Have a great day. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have uh, a young man on uh, the program named Frank Graves. Frank Graves is the president of Ecos Research. He's got some research Canadians are going to be interested in reading. So join us then. That is tomorrow on this very program. Rate, subscribe, YouTube, anywhere you get your fine podcasts as well. Dean Blundell Show. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Uh-huh.